awesome to welcome John Riley, head coach of the Perth Wildcats of the Australian NBL, to the Basketball Podcast. John Riley played 16 seasons in the NBL between 1995 and 2010 before embarking on a coaching career in the United States college system. Riley has been an assistant coach for the Australian Boomers, helping guide the Boomers to the bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympics. Also, in 481 NBL games, Riley averaged 16.3 points, 5.8 rebounds, 3.7 assists, and 1.1 steals per game. Riley played his college basketball at Gonzaga and joined Boise State as an assistant coach and then an associate head coach. In 2017, he was hired an assistant coach for the UC Santa Barbara Gauchos. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot for having me, Chris. Enjoying uh, listening to it, so hopefully I can add something to your listeners out there. Well, you'll add value. I mean, your experiences are diverse, and you ran this year the top offense in the NBL for points per possession. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, w- was that the goal going into the season? Look, it's always a goal to score more points than the opposition. Uh, trying to be the number one offense wasn't something uh, that we were trying to achieve, but uh, like when you have the MVP candidate, yearly candidate in Bryce Cotton, Uh, you know you're going to have some form of good offense. Um, What I really had to do, though, being a first-year head coach, was scale back. I come in with all these grand ideas and the way we would uh, play offense. But uh, once I realized I was trying to get too tricky and let the players play a little bit more, it turned into something special. Well, that's interesting to hear. Can you possibly give us an example of something that you might have to scale back? Uh, so, so I'm the third head coach in three years at this franchise, a very storied franchise, and each coach was a little different in their style. Uh, so I come in with these great ideas of, um, you know, playing out of concepts and letting players use their skill, uh, where previously they were probably a little bit more rigid offensively. Um, so I, I, I scaled back our, our play calls or, you know, playing out a uh, the continuity of our flow offense and just, you know, morphing into what we become at the end of the year. So the best half court offense in the NBL, 1.044 points per possession, which was obviously number one in the league. Do you uh, attest that then to some of the freedom the players had, but then how did you put them in the best situation to be able to be free in terms of you talking about scaling it back? Yeah, so like uh, I want to play a free-flowing style of offense. So we always start with a couple uh, guards that are capable of making plays for themselves or their teammates and have the ability to space the floor. So uh, Bryce Cotton, as I mentioned before, Corey Webster, who's a New Zealand product, who's an international bucket getter, but has the ability to make plays. Uh, But then we had two bigs, Brady Manick uh, of the North Carolina variety. He can really space the floor. Uh, But the thing uh, that was really good, uh, Brady's an elite cutter and he's a willing passer. Uh, And then we had Tayshawn Thomas, who's fired Houston and Oklahoma, but has had a successful pro career. Uh, I joke with people that outside of Jokic, probably the best short role player. Um, So when you have the combination of quality guards and then bigs that can make plays for other players, uh, you know, half the time it's just me staying out of the way. It sounds so simple that we just stay out of the way and they have a great offense, right? John? I, I, obviously there's more to it than that, of course. Uh, but uh, you yeah. mentioned Brady. So I just maybe give a perspective because you've coached in college basketball in the United States. Can you give a perspective about someone like Brady making the adjustment to play in the NBL, one of the top leagues in the world? What are some of the things that he would have to adjust to? Yeah. So the biggest thing for guys straight out of college is the shot clock. Uh, reduced to 24 seconds. Now, playing for Hubert Davis there at Carolina, they played a pretty fast style, so uh, telling Brady to shoot the ball wasn't something that I had to worry about. It was just him understanding, like, how to play off the ball, cutting, uh, you know, phenomenal pick-and-pop guy, but when teams want to switch with a smaller guy, just rolling uh, and accumulating points because... Uh, it doesn't matter what gym that guy walks into, he's going to get respect for his shooting. So if you want to evolve into a really good pro, you've got to be able to accumulate points, you know, uh, and cutting and offensive rebounding are two of the easiest ways and running the floor in transition. And the complexity of defense and the defensive rotations and different types of things you do defensively, does it does that get heightened a little bit at the NBL level? Absolutely. And the position, he was our four-man 
Uh, and probably outside the point guard spot, the four man is a position where you got to bring it every night. Um, you got like fringe NBA kind of guys that you're going against every night at that, that position. And uh, Xavier Cooks is probably the best example of that, where he's just been picked up with the Washington Wizards. Um, but you got the likes of Jarrell Brantley, Mitch Creek, um, Keanu Pinder, uh, DJ Hogue from AM there in Texas. So, uh, you know, you got some high level dudes you're going against every night. Absolutely. And uh, the other thing that I want to pick up on that you mentioned is the short roll. And that's a concept, obviously, that's evolved over the last 10 years, especially in basketball. You know, the Tim Duncan kind of short roll and being able to make a play from that spot. Can you talk a little bit about the decision maybe that, uh, you know, you have a new big that comes to you? What are some of the cues that you're giving the big in terms of a short roll versus, say, a pop or versus a deep roll? Yeah, first and foremost, you're playing with guards that are going to attract a lot of attention. Uh, the second thing that goes into that is what kind of coverage or what's the base coverage of the team you're playing against in the night? Uh, and then are we going to work it out of a step up? Is it going to be more of a drag or are we just going to go on middle ball screen to try and manipulate the defense so we can best take advantage of the, the pocket and the spacing that we can create uh, with the good decision makers in that part of the floor? So uh, good guards are a good starting point, though. And then the type of decision in terms of the depth of their role, is it simply a cue to be able to find the space in the defensive situation where you're reading your defender, but also the help? Yeah, look, absolutely finding the space. Now, if they want to, they, they want to be aggressive, I, I'm asking them to rim run because you got to create so much space behind whether you want to play four on three or three on two if they're being aggressive. Now, if it's, if it's switching or up to touch or a drops defense, then you got to find that window, the appropriate window to your skill set, your shot making ability. So when you catch that, you're getting the eyes of the defense. Whereas if, you, if you're not a three point shooter and you're catching it on the three point line, you're not creating any advantage. So uh, understanding where that ideal window is so you get multiple sets of eyes. And at the end of the day, like we have quick hitting sets to uh, create the advantage and then keep the advantage. Yeah, it's fun stuff to be able to think and talk about. And uh, I've heard some other coaches reference it to the importance of balance in terms of a short roll, a deep roll, and a flare, assuming you can do all three things. Is is that something, something, sometimes something that you have to point out to your players because they get too used to doing one thing and maybe they don't see some other options? Yeah, look, this year with Tayshawn Thomas, and as I said, like he's elite in the short roll. Um, but to mix it up, uh, you know, sometimes we would want him popping because he was very good playing in the slot with the ball in his hand. Uh, so the thing that we wanted to work on to create the space or create a little confuse, confusion is we always get that next guy to dive. So if our biggest pop and that next guy is diving to create, uh, first and foremost, a scoring opportunity for that guy, but then also uh, hopefully creating a two-on-one on that weak side. Um, so with guys like that, I'm, I'm comfortable with mixing it up and, uh, you know, coming from the college uh, game where you're probably a little bit more rigid and telling guys it's either one thing or the other. Uh, it, it was nice to allow guys to have the freedom and flexibility and uh, just playing out of that. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, the other thing you mentioned a little bit is in terms of the pick and roll, the different locations of setting the screen. And I'm imagining that's a huge difference, too, is the emphasis and importance of angles in terms of setting the pick and roll. Is that something that is a big difference between college and uh, obviously the pro system as well? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll give my, I'll give uh, Jeff Linder a good pump up here. I've worked with him at Boise State for six years. So uh, with both of us studying a lot of European basketball, to, as simplest as you could keep it is you want to make that defender have to chase over the screen. Now, whether that's you're attacking their low foot, whether you're attacking the side of the hip, whatever your terminology is, uh, but, but at the end of the day, you have to make sure that defender goes over the top. So then that big is put in a tough situation. Does he help? Does he recover? Um, and then the, the other thing is, is, are we getting it high enough on the floor where you still play to the guard's advantage, where they're coming off in a scoring situation? Uh, and it's not too low. So if they do go under, it just becomes a, a quagmire of bodies in the Kiwi. Yeah, Jeff Linder's a, a, a big fan of European basketball. Was a great guest on this podcast talking about a lot of those situations. Great shout out. And then in terms of if they do go under, 
Is it automatically a twist or what are some different ways that we can attack the under? Yeah, look, great question. So if, if the guard's a guy that is, is not known from his perimeter shooting, you want to have them to have the ability to just get downhill, get into the paint, and then create some type of advantage, get the defense looking. Now, if you come off and you want to manipulate it, give yourself plenty of space and timing so when they go under, it's an automatic rescreen, and then hopefully you can engage them that they have to chase over, and then you still have enough space to either roll or play in the pocket uh, to get to what you wanted out of that initial ball screen. But we, we in general, are a rescreen as soon as you go under, but Look, you want the guard getting into the paint. We all talk about paint touches, and uh, I certainly am a fan of uh, charting paint touches. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm curious then because I've heard this from other coaches too. If if defensively you do go under, generally the rule for a defender that goes under is not to go under to go under again, right? In yeah. Terms of that, is yeah. that something you avoid? For sure. Now look at at the pro level or at the NBL. Uh, some teams will just flat go under until you probably get to about 15, 10 to 15 feet. So that's where playing with the right pace, playing with good screening angles, so you don't allow that to happen because the minute they go over, I'm, I'm backing our players in that situation to create something good for our offense. Um, but at the end of the day, there's no secret. You've got to be able to manipulate that situation to the advantage of the offensive team. It helps, as you said already, with some of the players you have. And uh, you mentioned Bryce Cotton. I'm curious, when you come and take over a job like this and you have someone as established and obviously effective like Bryce Cotton, are you going to him initially? Are you watching film initially? How are you approaching him in terms of trying to set up the best situation for him so he can be the best version of himself? Yes, like our initial conversations were about uh, me getting a better understanding of how he likes to score the ball. Uh, it's easy to say, oh, just give him the ball and get out of the way. But like over the course of 40 minutes, that takes a lot of energy and effort. And when you've got five sets of eyes on you every time down the court, that's tough work for 40 minutes. So where on the floor, how can he come off screens? Is he better off coming off pin downs versus flares and all of that type of stuff? But then I went into the archives and looked at how he played for previous coaches and the different situations that he got himself in. Um, so it's all about efficiency and Bryce is a very efficient scorer. So getting him in spots, uh, where I know he can be successful. Would he have a better understanding of what he likes as well? Having played for a few different coaches over the last few years. Yeah. And, and look, he's well into his pro career where he knows where his sweet spots are on the floor. Uh, so how, how can we dummy it up so he can get to the sweet spot? And then, uh, that's when we can just admire his greatness. Another part of the greatness of your offense was obviously having low turnovers and high assists. And uh, I'm curious where that is that an emphasis that shone through practice that transferred to game or how did we build that other than great players? Yeah, look, uh, as a coach, one of my pet peeves is turnovers. Uh, and I come in thinking that these are things that you're going to have to address. But uh, we had experienced guards. Uh, Mitch Norton plays for the Australian team. Uh, the Webster brothers, uh, Bryce Cotton, and then we had bigs that could play with the ball in their hands. And I think that's something that gets overlooked. When you want to be a low turnover team, you need five guys that have the ability to look after the ball, but also make decisions because the way the game's played these days where you want bigs executing DHOs and all kinds of different things and playing out of the short role as a playmaker, uh, their IQ and their understanding of the value of the ball. So... I was very lucky this year that we just morphed into that. My teams, I want them to be able to be willing passes, share the ball, because if you have to respect all five guys on the floor, that, that's going to make it a little bit more fun and a little easier to score. And, and did you agree with the, the mantra of shooting it before you turn it over to a certain extent as well? Is that something that could have evolved more in the college game, in the NCAA game in particular? Yeah, it's, and, and look, I'm sitting around like any other coach that team's not playing at this time of the year. I'm watching a lot of NCAA basketball and, and the amount of good shots that are passed up just to eat into the clock or get to the third side or whatever their rules may be. Uh, but then also some of these teams run great false motion, but they turn it over because they're just trying to move the defense instead of 
you know, getting your best two players involved in some type of action. John, you played at Gonzaga, you've coached in the NCAA, you've coached in the Olympics, you've played at the national level, you played at the professional level, and you've coached at the professional level. So from a curiosity standpoint, uh, what are some of the things you're seeing from NCAA teams offensively? You look, you, you, your player IQ and, and your player acumen is going to dictate how tricky you can get on offense. Um, so if you've got a low skill, low IQ team, you probably want to simplify it. So you, you, you know, you narrow that margin of error down and you might have to live with what you deem as questionable shots. But if they're your best shot makers taking the shots, uh, that's what we want at the end of the day. Or that's what I want at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, getting direct actions, I mean, versus the ball reversal seems to be a thing that's kind of still, you know, it, yep. it's kind of in conflict a little bit for some coaches, I know. Yeah, so look, you do have to have ball reversal to some degree, especially transition first side. It doesn't matter what level you play. First side, secondary action, the points per possession are low. It doesn't matter whether you're a good or bad offensive team. That'll be in your low. Um, you do have to get ball reversal, but then I do think you have to start to get heat on the paint so you can really get into the teeth of the defense and get some type of bite on, on the penetration. So we really, uh, the things we chart uh, are paint touches and then what I call potential assists is we might be having a bad night shooting the ball, but if we're sharing the ball and getting great shots, you know, water finds its level. So if we keep creating great shots, we're, we're, our offense will come to fruition at some stage. Well, and I think we're both seeing it watching the tournament. I'm enjoying it a lot more from an offensive perspective than in years past. I think a lot more teams are using a lot more modern spacing, uh, you know, corners and 45 slots, whatever it may be. And then uh, a lot more kind of direct action. And then some teams are playing certainly to shoot the first shot that they get in terms of that as well. So it is interesting. And uh, have you noticed big changes over the years in you watching college basketball? Yeah, the, the biggest change I would say over the, like I was in college basketball for 12 years, uh, when I would go out recruiting for the first three or four years, people would be curious and ask you about international basketball, but it, it was just a question to ask someone hmm. where I think probably over the last eight to 10 probably there's a little more substance. The access, thanks to Synergy and places like that, where you can just look up EuroLeague and EuroLeague gets broadcasted across the world now. Uh, it, it's just, it's easier to find these days. So I think people's understanding and they do see that uh, in FIBA concepts can be uh, apl applicable to college versus the NBA and their defensive rules. Yeah, and you've referenced this relative to some of your players, but the manipulation of the defense with a ball screen seems to be at a much higher level where, you know, whether it's a snake dribble or a hostage dribble or some of these different ways to be able to manipulate, just college guards seems to be a lot better. And that I, that comes top down from the pro level on down, doesn't it? Yes, the, the guards for sure, but also uh, like just the bigs and the way coaches are allowing bigs to screen, like, um, you know, the old school you know, jump stop, squeak your feet, you know, <laughs> pop your feet, and then you can roll. You know, you need a stopwatch to time these guys where now it's it's a little it's a little bit more artistic, you know, getting in, getting out, just make sure the guy goes over the top so the guy can get downhill and play some basketball. So I think that's been the biggest growth is uh, the bigs and the flexibility they have with their screening. And you referenced it in watching your team. I thought you did an outstanding job this year of uh, empowering your players off the ball to be able to cut. So I'm just curious, what are some of the cues that you give your players off the ball in terms of making the decision to cut? And do you have a preferred spot of that cut, whether it be the 45 or the corner? No, look, I, I don't have a preference because if you feel like you've got a scoring opportunity, maximize that scoring opportunity, and then you'll just always space to the other side of the floor because our, our flow game was a two-side, three-side kind of action. So our, our spacing would just morph. And the four perimeter shots, uh, spots that we would play out of that, I, I didn't care whether it was a guard and a big because if the guard, uh, the big's in the corner and the guard's in the slot, just turn it into a step up. So then that becomes a tough angle to defend 
uh, and then vice versa, bigs just dribble handoff or create a side pick and roll. Um, but obviously spacing wise, if you play in short roll, it's great to cut out of the corners um, because on the short roll, someone's usually stepping up to take that guy. So there's going to be space along the baseline. Now, if it's more of a flat or a side ball screen, that 45 cut is the dangerous one. I love it. And uh, you mentioned flow a few times and uh, European ball screen flow. Um, Andre Lemonez, of course, Brian Gorgian, all these wonderful Australian coaches that have, uh, you know, brought the flow game to another level, I feel. Is, is, is there something in particular that you've seen in flow over the last few years that you feel can make it even better in terms of making it maybe a less predictable and more of a you know, basketball decisions are going to proceed basketball plays type of offense. Yeah, so uh, what what we morphed our flow into this year is if, if you were coming to, say, the triple side where you got the three guys, you got the top, you got the wing, and then you got the corner, uh, I would give our bigs the flexibility if they wanted to play just through the elbow, kind of like the old Jerusalem stuff mm, would okay. do. Um, if you can just play through the elbows because a team wants to deny the guard, like have the guard stand out at half court and we'll just play four on four with a lot more space. Now, if the big does come and uh, get the catch up the top, you can get more of your zoom actions or pin down actions out of that type of stuff. So, uh, and that's where Thomas was very good for us is he had a great understanding of playing through the elbows or just lifting, getting a catch, and then playing some zoom action on that second or third side. Now, flip that over. Brady Manick uh, was very good at playing through the elbows, and if teams wanted to load up on that other side, he could just step out and make that three-point shot. So uh, the flexibility of our bigs and then just trusting that they can make good reads of what the defense allowing them to do. That's fascinating to hear you say that, kind of those two things morphing together, which makes sense. And is that matchup based or is that personnel based? What, how, what determines that in terms of them staying low or playing through the elbows? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's never an exact science, but, uh, you know, te teams practice their own base defense all year long. So I always feel like uh, most teams you are trying to play through uh, the free throw line and above or the free throw line and below. So depending on how I feel we can best attack their defense. If we want to play below the foul line, I'm trying to get the bigs to get the catch on the elbow. If we're, we feel like we need to play higher up on the floor, we'll play more zoom action or gets action. So we're more space and we can play along the baseline cutting action. Love it. Love it. Love hearing this. And I get asked many times by high school, college coaches who play against flow a lot what's the best strategy to be able to develop that or to be able to defend that three side? Do you, do you have a preference? Let's, let's ignore personnel. Let's say you have ideal personnel to play the ideal defense. What's your preference yeah. in terms of that? Yeah, look, I, I think the keeping the guy in the low hole and switching out, um, you, you know, so you always got some guy that can help or muddy up the waters if, if it's a catastrophe, uh, now, what I will say, because, you know, internationally in European basketball, you see every type of defense to handle this, is the coach that tries to more five different styles into one, you're just going to confuse your players and you'll get good at none of them. So uh, you got to figure out what you're prepared to live with. And uh, I think any coach, you, you have to understand where the weakness is. And if you get beat that way, you just tip your hat to the offense and go down the other end and hopefully drop a three on them. In your league, that happens a lot, I'm sure, where you just have to <laughs> tip your hat to the other guy because, yeah. And you know what? The other unique part about your league is it's it's like you're playing the same opponent more often than you would in some other pro leagues just because there aren't as many teams. And that's got to be both a strength and a weakness, isn't it? it for sure. So there's 10 teams. Uh, so you, the nine teams you play, you're playing eight of them three times. And what's considered your rival, you play them four times. Um, yeah, it's a tricky balance uh, because if, if you have the wood on a couple of the teams, you will uh, be relaxed the next time around and vice versa. So uh, making sure you're pushing the right buttons for your team at the appropriate time is necessary.
No, you did well with that this year. And uh, I'm curious because I've talked to some NBA coaches about this, about scouting reports and stuff too, in terms of especially their conference opponents that they see a little bit more. And the question is, do you find try and find an opponent that plays similar to you to be able to really zero in on specific scout stuff, you know, in addition to obviously watching their last few games? Yeah, look, both sides of the ball. Uh, teams that defend like us uh, is a great measuring stick so our players can see the success of that defense. Uh, and then on the, on the flip side, teams that have some of the same offensive concepts or some similar actions that we may implement uh, so they can see uh, how we can attack them uh, and, and have success on both sides of the ball. So uh, we keep our scouting report pretty simplistic. Uh, All of our games are broadcast live and there's not much uh, carryover in between time slots. Uh, So our guys are lucky that if uh, if you're at home sitting on the couch, you can take in pretty much all the games. Uh, I know when I was there for two weeks, I got to take in a lot of games. And unfortunately, you're out of town when I was in Perth. But um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask, because I heard this a lot over there and the challenges for an NBL team in terms of developing players which is a big foundation of all the, uh, the teams over there is player development versus obviously playing your best players and winning. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about how you approach player development? Yes. Well, f- first and foremost, the player needs to have an appetite to get better and w- willing and want to drive themselves to get better. Uh, then providing an atmosphere in your practice. Uh, so for, for MBL, uh, you're allowed 11 contracted players maybe a next star, and then you can have uh, four development players. So you could have a roster of roughly 15 or 16 guys. Uh, so I, I try to structure the first half of my practice where everyone is there involved, uh, so there's no standing around. Uh, and then obviously when you get to the five-on-five part, you know, some guys are getting less reps and minutes. So uh, the best way to develop is through play. So I try and create that in some part of my practice so everyone gets a go. But then uh, having a staff and a development plan for each guy outside of practice time so they can keep working on that. Uh, and then the beauty of Australia, the young guys get to play in like the second tier competition in the off season. So our guys that are playing in that, uh, they go away with a couple of ideas that I want them working on while they're with their second division team. No, that's good that you mentioned that. I was going to ask you about that because especially some of those development players, those under 23 players, the, the one challenge is getting them game reps. So they play in the NBL one or in uh, New Zealand. Yeah, either or. Uh, Now, an Australian guy plays as an import or a a foreign player in New Zealand. Uh, But there are benefits to that, I think. uh, So we're sending one of our younger guys, Michael Harris, to play for Otago. I want him to feel like what it is to be an import and have the responsibility of the team and their performance. I want him to feel what that's about like uh and and i think that really helps with the growth and taking ownership of your own performance and the team's result yeah i got a chance to go to otago beautiful place and uh, obviously tremendous basketball area so you can have, no doubt have a great experience there yeah you must have been there in the summer <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely that, that applies to a lot of places as you know um having lived in california too so um beautiful beautiful place all the time so that's why i'm here uh other part that goes with that a little bit you mentioned being a part of a storied franchise which is so cool for you no doubt uh but there's some strengths and some weaknesses can you talk a little bit about the strength about being part of a storied franchise like perth yeah look the strength is there's a high expectation uh so I like to tell my buddies in the U.S., I'm, I'm like at the Lakers of Australian basketball. So anything less than a championship, it's considered a failed year. Uh, so that that's a strength because anytime you're at a place where they want championships, for me, that's a, that's a great thing. Uh, it's obviously attractive for local talent because, you know, we're, we're a very professional organization uh with with everything just not on the court but off the court with you know our dedication to uh sports science you know nutrition psychology all of that type of stuff so we have staff in place to look after you off the floor as well um you know now the downside is you have a a very passionate fan base uh, and this year we went through a, a bad spell where we lost five in a row so you certainly know 
that you're not performing at the level and the expectation isn't being met. So uh, it, it was great to be a first year head coach and get the, the full gamut of it all this year. And then you mentioned obviously spending the 12 previous years in the college ranks. What, is, what are some things you took from the college ranks to be able to obviously add to your coaching or make over your coaching? Look, I was very fortunate enough to work for Leon Rice at Boise State and then Joe Pasternak at Santa Barbara. And two guys that totally work at different speeds. Uh, you know, Leon Rice is like the CEO, uh, has done very well, gets in assistance, uh, has them very hands-on with Pasternak, you know, micromanager. He wants to know everything that's going on in his program. So over the 12 years, that, that allowed me to figure out who I wanted to be as a coach. Because when you're a player going to coaching, you think you could transition into it ever so easily. But there's a lot more that goes into it that you're oblivious to when you're a player. So working for two completely different guys uh, allows you to truly figure out what you like and what you don't like. Um, so for that experience, I'm forever grateful to those two guys. Yeah, it's great. And then both in the tournament this year, both obviously yeah. incredibly successful and, uh, you know, very, very unique. And uh, when I think of Boise, obviously, I can always find a set that they run that's just tremendous in so many ways. And then I've watched Santa Barbara a number of times this year being on the West Coast and uh, just really they seem to really enjoy playing uh, together. And, uh, you know, that type of enthusiasm and style for the program. Is there anything else that stands out about those two programs for you? Uh <laughs> So Leon's uh, always uh, trying to be cutting edge regarding offense. And, you know, his 13 years there would show that because he's had some players to go on to the next level that were highly successful offensive players. Uh, his just in-game feel for what is going on in the moment uh, is, is I, you know, one of the best and probably something that doesn't get talked about enough um, you know, trusting your instinct or what the moment in the game requires. Like, uh, I can tell you, if it's if it's a close game and he probably feels like he's the underdog in the game, they're coming out of the timeout for like a enthusiastic play, whether that's a dunk or whether that's a three, um, to, to really have an emotional stand on the game. Uh, where where Pasternak is just relentless. Uh, you know, you ever watch him coach, he's coaching every possession. He's probably the sixth defender out there on a lot of the He's possessions. pretty active. <laughs> yes, but just, just his true passion and yeah. will to win uh, is, is unmatched in the college level. So any, any success that he's had is just through sheer hard work um, and just his dedication to the cause. Uh, it's fun and fun to see you obviously taking the reins here. And uh, I feel like you're extra qualified for this question since you're in the postseason a lot of teams are just approaching the postseason whatever their level they're coaching at and what are some things from the college professional level that you found best in terms of evaluation say exit meetings debriefing after a season yeah oh that's a, that's a great question is um be before we had our exit meetings with each player i actually sent six questions to each player and each staff member uh, so they came in prepared and, and it wasn't just all basketball. Like I had a number of players say, Oh, like we, this is actually something different. We've never done this. They were just thinking it was going to just be a complete chat about basketball. But if we want to grow and get better as an organization, you know, like what can we do to be more comforting for your family? How can we integrate, uh, your wife, your girlfriend, your partner, uh, you know, especially if they're coming from the U.S. or even if they're coming from another city here in Australia and they've never been to Perth. Um, because Perth is a beautiful city, uh, but it's way on the other side. So it's, it's not a destination that everyone comes to. So uh, that part of it, uh, we've got a team psychologist uh, that, that has been a, a great addition to our staff. So just making sure players understand that access. Um, and then you do, obviously, you get talking about the basketball part of it. Uh, and I always ask the players, what are their own expectations? And if their, their expectations are a little different to mine, then you've got to find that common ground so we can move forward in a good direction. 
Oh, that's fascinating. That's great to hear about that uh, part about the psychosocial part and their experience, obviously, with you and and the program. And uh, do you, do you find in those type of meetings that players generally at the professional level are very honest with you in terms of it's a it's an interactive conversation? Yeah, at, at first it's it's pretty, especially with the young guys. They're not quite sure, but then as it gets a little more comfortable, uh, they're opening up because. Uh, I always tell them like it, it's their livelihood. So if you sit on something that is agitating you and it doesn't get fixed or discussed, there's no chance of it, it getting better. So uh, we all want the right things. We all get paid to win basketball games. So let's create the best environment to allow that to happen. Yeah, I love that answer. That's great. Great phrasing in terms of explaining that to young players in particular. And then some of the basketball things that you focus on, you have a player signed in contract for the next year. They're coming back to you. You know, you're focusing on some things from the basketball perspective, but what are you specifically doing in terms of helping them with their development, especially those that aren't with you? Yeah, so uh, us as a staff, uh, just actually last week, we all got together uh, and just uh, – you know, figured out what we felt like two or three things were that each player needed to address in the off season. Uh, then our uh, coach that's in charge of player development, they'll, they'll come up with a plan for each player. So if, if we're not going to see a player for a couple months because they're playing in a different league, we can watch their games, we can give them feedback, and then we can watch to make sure they're, uh, you know, implementing what we want, you know, whether it's just being able to catch and shoot a three off a ball reversal or, How's your decision-making out of a pick and roll? Uh, that type of stuff. Now, other guys, your conversation is just purely about strength and conditioning, recovery, diet. Are you looking after yourself to give your best, best, yourself the best chance to have a successful season, which isn't always basketball-related? Yeah, of course not. And uh, for you, I know, like, uh, we talked about the tremendous offense. We know there's some challenges, uh, obviously, defensively and rebounding that you need to address. Is that a question of personnel or is that a question of scheme? What are some things that kind of stand out for you in terms of evaluating that and moving forward to improve those areas? Yeah, look, all, all of the above. Yeah. Um, probably this roster, the roster we had this year, uh, we just didn't have any natural rebounders. Uh, no, no one's probably going to ever average 10 a game on our roster, but I just thought as a group we could get it done. Um, so that, but then obviously our schemes. So this week, our staff, uh, one of our assistants will present all of our ball screen defensive coverage. We'll, we'll mill over that and we'll discuss what we feel was good, bad. And uh, when you have the emotion of the season behind you, uh, it's amazing that some things aren't as bad as you think they were and other things weren't quite as good as you thought they were. So that's the stage of the sea or the off season we're at right now, just evaluating how we can scheme better for the personnel. It's amazing how you can look at things differently when emotions not involved, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And look, uh, I give my assistants the freedom to come with thoughts and ideas and everyone looks at it a little differently. And this is when we can do it without any emotion attached to it. And, uh, we we can uh, chew the fat over it and see where we get to. Do you uh, give your assistants development plans as well or special assignments or do they come up with their own? How does that work within your program? So I, I uh, every week through the off season, one assistant will present some area of the game. So to give you an example, we got an intern. So last week he presented like our dribble handoff defense, like good, bad. And of course, a theme comes through of how you give up particular shots on your dribble handoff defense if you don't apply it the way you want it to play. Um, but then he just goes, he looks some of the better defending NBL teams in that situation. He looks at some EuroLeague teams. So then he presents clips with that. So I'll give them the skeleton and they can run with it with however they would like because uh, when they bring that stuff, it just stimulates better conversation and creates uh, more thinking ideas and str strategy as well. I love that. Can you, can you give us a few other ideas of certain types of projects that might happen within the weeks? Uh, so uh, transition offense, uh, like e everyone, you know, everyone talks about playing hot, fast and all of that. But like, as I said earlier on in this, and any team at any level, they're, they're Points per possession on the first side in transition is probably going to be their worst offense most of the time because you just take bad shots, you know. So 
Uh, we got a couple secondary breaks in our transition, whether it's just drags or we'll stagger away. So what's our best actions and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll do a deep dive into that. Um, uh, what else? I'm just trying to think off the top of my head what else we've done. Um, dribble handoff, trans. Um, well, just, just, one, just one on one. Just one on one defense, hmm. um, you know. Uh, and yeah. you mentioned you referenced obviously your, your league and your league as a comparison. Is that generally the case? Like, I mean, I know you watch college basketball, you watch the NBA, but th those leagues don't translate as much in terms of some of the things that you need to improve as, as opposed to say your league, would they? Euro league champions league, any yeah. of those high European teams. And, and the easiest way to see if it translates is like, if some of the players have played in some of the similar leagues, uh, it, it's a great measuring stick um, to see about that. So that's why we concentrate on that. Now, I'm sure once the NBA playoffs start and a little bit more strategy comes into it all, we'll, we'll put a better eye to some of that stuff as well. But that's usually at the offensive end and some of the concepts that come out of that as well. Uh, that sounds fun. We'd love to all hear all those project results uh, every week. So please report to us. Um, of course, you're an assistant coach with the national team and uh, went to the Tokyo Olympics, for example. Uh, can you give us uh, one of the highlights of being at the Tokyo Olympics? Oh, well, that's that's easy. Uh, being being part of a team that was uh, the first men's senior team to win a medal at any international event. So... Uh, as a player, uh, back in the late 90s and 2000s, that was one of my own personal goals, was to try and be on a team that won a medal. So to, to miss that opportunity as a player, um, but to be put back in that as a coach to do that, and just, just being in the locker room after that, uh, just to see uh, the jubilation and the emotion of all of that with guys that have been in that program. Uh, for many years, decades, uh, and see it to come through was just phenomenal. Uh, no doubt. Tremendous, tremendous to watch your team play. And uh, what was maybe a basketball takeaway for you? Something that uh, you noticed at the Olympics that maybe you were surprised by or that, uh, you know, you put in your coaching bag for later? Yeah, look, uh, that, that's easy because uh, you talk about college and uh, when I worked for Joe Pasenek, like his mantra coming from Bobby Knight is, you know, you just go, we're going to do the same thing over and over again until we just do it great. Where, uh, you know, in the bronze medal game, we're playing Slovenia and Luca. Uh, and, and, you know, if I would have went with that mentality at the defensive end, we would have got blitzed by 50. So just, just understanding that you, you need to change up your defenses instead of just telling your players to do it better and execute it better. And in that example, like, are you trying some defenses that you haven't used basically all tournament because that's how good he is and you have to try and throw some stuff at him? Yeah, or just every time out, we're just changing it up mm -hmm. so you keep them second guessing. And at that level, if you can just disrupt three or four possessions a game, uh, it's going to go a long way to helping you win. That's great. And uh, what was something maybe off the court that stood out to you that, uh, you know, you took with you and then took back to your coaching? Oh, it just when when you get around the level of NBA athlete that Australia has now, uh, just what goes in to keeping them at that level. Now, you know, you've got some guys making a couple mil, you've got other guys, you know, up towards the 15, 20. But what they're prepared to do around the clock to give themselves the best chance to to keep that financial situation last as long as it can. Uh, you know, the diligence of a Matt Delavadova or a Patty Mills, uh, once practice is done, what they're doing with their body and what they're putting in their body, they're stretching, uh, you know, like Delhi would wheel around the suitcase with all kinds of dumbbells and seat belts and all of this kind of stuff. So he was ready to go and uh, just to be around that and understand truly that what those guys put in to allow that to happen and then perform at a high level is phenomenal. I'm imagining that interaction amongst those players must have been fascinating as well to kind of see them kind of do their thing and then kind of observe someone else doing their thing as well. And uh, did you notice that type of interaction in terms of the players, again, learning from each other and some of their habits that they do? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like Josh Green was on that team, the Dallas Mavericks, Josh Green. And I think he just finished his rookie year in the NBA uh, with limited opportunity. Um, but for him to see like the way Delhi conducts himself is way different to Patty Mills. And then you throw in Joe Ingles or Aaron Baines. They all have their routine, though. And that's I remember having a conversation with Josh and just saying, like, you got to figure out what your routine is. And it doesn't matter what it is, but you need to have a routine so you feel comfortable. And every time you step into uh, the arena, you know you got your routine that'll put you in a good mind frame to be successful at night. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, that concept of a routine, because I think sometimes it gets misconstrued when we kind of post, oh, this is what Steph Curry's doing post pregame or whatever it may be. And it's really their routine for comfort and confidence. And then the second part of that is obviously what they do for their development. And I'm imagining being with that team, you saw both sides of those, didn't you? Oh, look, Patty Mills may be the most diligent pre-workout guy with his footwork that I've ever seen. Like diligent, but then when he goes for 42 in the bronze medal game, you go, I know he rests easy every night going, every second that I dedicated to that was well and truly worth it. Then you got Joe Ingles, it comes out and like, he's not the fastest moving guy to start with, but he's slow motion, but he's working on his footwork, he's follow through, but you know he's just doing this so he feels good about his shot. So when the referee throws the ball up, he's ready to go. And that is the thing. You have to understand what gets you ready. And a young player, high school, college, it may take you a little while to understand what this is and you need to experiment. But the sooner you can figure out what a routine is, the, the, sooner, the closer you are to success. That's great. And uh, what, what were some of the things that Patty did with footwork? I, I've seen him do some of the spins and some of the different dribbles to shoot. Was there anything else in terms of that that stood out? The one thing I will say... He always started close to the basket with his shot making. He didn't just come out blazing threes or working on hezzy pull-ups and all of that kind of stuff. He got in the gym, saw the ball go through the hoop, and then he gradually moved away and then gradually added more specific footwork. But you, you, can, never, you can never forget that seeing the ball go through the basket is a powerful thing. It, it's such a fascinating thing for me, you saying that, because... My, my 11 year old daughter actually now resists doing anything like that because she feels like she's going backwards. You, you, and it's such a psychology that to me makes sense when she says it now, but obviously eventually we're going to bring her back to that. But in her mind, it feels like, oh, wait a minute, am I bad? I have to go back and do this. And I imagine that's a process that a lot of players go through. Does that make sense? It, absolutely. And uh, you know, you start to date yourself when you tell guys, well, this is how I used to start off with. I used to walk in the gym and do 60 Mikans. Mm -hmm. Now, on a bad day, I'd miss one Mikan, so I'd go 60 for 61. So all of a sudden, I'm already in a great mindset. I'm shooting almost 100%. So whatever happens the rest of the day, I'm still going to leave the gym feeling like I've shot a good percentage. So that's where I'm just a big believer in seeing the ball go through early is, is it. I don't, I don't know anything better than that. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I'll keep you updated on what she kind of goes to eventually. But I, I get it from her perspective in terms of that. And then, of course, the mic and these different types of memorization type drills are for comfort and confidence. They're for you, as you said, psychologically seeing it go in. Not as much about development, but it's about you kind of getting your routine and getting it done. Yeah. And look, you could say the same for free throws. Like, uh Show me a great free throw shooter that was a bad shooter. <laughs> Very few. What, what, what did you find for some of these guys with their free throws? Did you find they did mass reps or did you find that they just mix in some stuff? I mean, most of it's psycho psychology and practicing their routines, but how were they practicing their free throws? Yeah, the, the routine, but what I would say is during their individual workouts, uh, after each segment or reps or whatever, they, they're shooting X amount of free throws, it's just so they're in some type of game rhythm. But then at the end, that's where you're doing your reps or you're creating a swish game or, you know, some kind of challenging uh, attribute where you, you need to concentrate, but you're really getting your form and your muscle memory down.
That's tremendous stuff. And then uh, John Riley, the head coach now, what is he going to do to be able to improve himself in the offseason? We mentioned some of these projects and some of these different things, but what are some of the areas that you're going to focus on personally? Yeah, so f- f- for me, uh, just just becoming calmer uh, regarding in-game situations. So when I watch, re-watch our games, uh, I'm, the eye I look at it, you know, what could I do different? What could have I maybe come out of a timeout with a little different? Uh, you know, how, how can you create the ultimate confidence in your team when they leave, you know, to start a game out of a timeout? Because you only get so many times to leave your footprint on a team when they leave to go out on the court. And putting them in the right mindset of success is very important. Oh, I may be joking, but if you figure that one out, you can definitely sell that strategy to be calmer. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but in serious, like, how are you approaching that? Is that with a psychologist? Is that just generally self-awareness? What, what are some specific ways to do that? Yes, look, I, I certainly buy into and utilize our team psychologist. Uh, re- reading, uh, I'm a terrible reader. Uh, but I, I'm forcing myself to read so I understand how other professions do it. So instead of just being embedded in basketball, let me go outside that comfort zone so I can see how other organizations handle, how the coaches handle those situations. And then uh, just actually getting some time to yourself where you can just let your mind wander. I'm very fortunate. I live close to the ocean, the beach here, so I can. it's easy for me to get away, but I need to utilize that a little bit more. John, so many wonderful things you've shared. Curious, moving from your first year to your second year, what are the expectations? Look, they, they always heighten. Uh, as I said, Perth is all about championships. So uh, two years ago, they missed out on the playoffs the first time in 35 years. We made it this year. Um, but, you know, that, that wasn't good enough. So first and foremost, I have to improve as a coach. Uh, and that's just, as we talked about on this, this isn't just the X's and O's. This is me understanding my players better. How, how can I get the most out of them through my communication? So, uh, like, biggest thing for me from year one to two is communication. That's with my players. That's with the organization. Communicating with the officials. Uh, you know, so... If I can become a better communicator, I know we'll be a better team. Well, Perth's in great hands, and we are as well. Thank you so much for sharing with us. No worries. I appreciate it, Chris.